Some things in three dimensions work very similar to the way things were in two dimensions, but some things are different. So let's take a moment to appreciate a few of the differences that we might not have thought about on our own. For example, in two dimensions, we know parallel lines never intersect. So if you have two lines that don't intersect, guaranteed they're parallel, not in 3D. On the screen, we have a blue line and we have a red line. These two lines will never intersect. They're called skew. This red line continues this way. The blue line continues this way. They are never going to cross into each other. They'll cross over. The red one will go right over the blue one without ever touching it. But these lines are not parallel. We call them skew. Skew did not exist in two dimensions. It's a new idea for 3D. On the next picture, we have two circles that are interconnected, but they have no points in common. That was never possible in 2D. If you tried to draw two circles where they were interconnected, they'd have to pass through each other. But I can see the blue circle loops around the red circle and the red circle loops around the blue circle, kind of like chains, how they're interlocking, but they're not actually sharing a single point in common. And then lastly, we're going to compare what x equals 0 looks like in our three different spaces. In one dimension, it was a number line with a point on it. So the point on the x equals 0 represented the equation x equals 0. But if we switch to R2, then we have two dimensions. x equals 0 became a line. So in one dimension, x equals 0 is represented as a point. In two dimensions, x equals 0 is represented as a line. In three dimensions, our, our line gets an extra dimension. x equals 0 is represented as an entire plane. So one equation can be represented very differently depending on which coordinate system you're considering. So we'll have to keep that in mind as well. Distance in 3D. Well, in two dimensions, we had a distance formula that came from the Pythagorean theorem. In three dimensions, we're going to have to adjust that just a bit. If I want the distance between the two green points on the screen, I need to recognize that we're traveling in the x direction, in the y direction, and the z direction. So we're changing in three different directions, which means our distance formula needs to incorporate each of these three changes. Together, those three changes can measure the distance between the two green points, which is the white dashed line. So if we look at the formula that I have here, the first two terms inside of our square root should look rather familiar. We're just adding on this third dimension. So since we're changing in the z direction, we need to incorporate that. And so we can use our distance formula um, just by making a small adjustment. So let's practice using it just for good measure. If I want to find the distance between point 1 and point 2, what I need to do is label each one of these a certain value. So we can call point 1 the x0, y0, z0 if we like. And we can call point 2 just the x, y, and z's if we like. Plugging that into our formula, we can find the distance between those two points. So if I start with x minus x0, that would be negative 2 minus 2 square that. I'm going to add to that y minus y0, which is 3 minus 1, square that, then add to that z minus z0, 0 minus 5, square that. I need to sum all of those squares and then square root them to get the final distance formula. So let's go ahead and simplify this. For our final answer of 3 root 5. So using the adjusted distance formula, we were able to find how far apart point 1 and point 2 were. They're a distance of 3 root 5. Now that is our exact answer.
but maybe we can't really picture what that looks like um, in terms of a length that we're familiar with. So if we want, we can turn that into a decimal for an approximate answer, which would look like about 6.71. That's our approximate answer. And we don't have any specific units, so we would just say 6.71 units. We've talked about coordinate planes, the xy plane, the xz plane, and the yz plane. And we've also talked about the equations that pair up with those. And now we're going to talk about planes that are parallel to those coordinate planes. Remember that the xy plane is the equation z equals 0. The xz plane is the equation y equals 0. And the yz plane is the equation x equals 0. But if we shift away from those planes, we can create planes parallel to them. Any plane that's parallel to the xy plane that contains a given point, so our point is a, b, c, would have to be the equation z equals c. Let's take a moment to digest that here. We know that we have an xy plane, so let's think about our 3D coordinate system. If I have x, y, and z, the xy plane is this plane in the bottom of our coordinate system. And if I were in the xy plane, I would be at z equals 0. But if I'm parallel to that, then maybe I'm up here in this plane. And if I know that there's a point inside of that plane that has the coordinates a, b, c, then I know that that plane has to have the equation z is equal to c the z value of the point we know that lives in that plane. And we can repeat this argument for the other planes parallel to the other coordinate planes. For example, the xz plane. If we know that there is a parallel plane that contains the point abc, if it's parallel to the xz plane, then it has to have a fixed value for y. So the equation would be y equals the b value of that point. And if I am talking about a plane parallel to the yz plane, and I know that there's a point in this parallel plane with the coordinates a, b, c, then I know the equation of that plane has to be x equals a, because any plane parallel to the yz plane has a fixed value for x. So this will be our little shortcut rule. If we know the plane is parallel to one of our coordinate planes, and we know a point in that parallel plane, we can quickly come up with the equation for this parallel plane. Let's try it. We want to write the equation of a plane that passes through the point 3, 11, 7, and we know that it's parallel to the yz plane. If it's parallel to the yz plane, then it has to have a fixed value for x, which means our equation has to be x equals 3. Let's try another one. Find an equation of a plane passing through these three given points. Now this is a, the same concept, but it's presented to you kind of in reverse. If I know that a plane is parallel to any one of our coordinate planes, then one of our values, x, y, or z, has to be fixed. So if I look through each one of these given points, can I see one of the x, y, or z values is the same? We sure can. I see negative 2 for a y value in all three of these points. That means the plane that passes through these points has to have that fixed value y equals negative 2. Now we will get into how to come up with equations of planes that are not parallel to our coordinate planes, but for now we're just getting our toes wet. Spheres. We have talked about circles. You've probably also seen cylinders. In three dimensions we can talk about a sphere. The definition of a sphere is the set of points that are the exact same distance from a center point. So in our diagram here, I have my center point, 
and I'm going to put that that or the location of that is A, B, C. And then I'm saying that the distance from that center point is the same for any point on that sphere. And we're going to call that distance R as if it were a radius. The equation for a sphere is really similar to the equation of a circle, except for it has the Z component added on. So you've done this before with circles, where if you know the center of the circle and you know the radius of the circle, then you can easily make the equation of the sphere, sorry, of the circle. We're going to extrapolate that and now use it for spheres. So let's find the standard equation of a sphere with a given center. And the sphere is going to have this point as one of the points on the sphere. So that could be like this green point on the outside of the sphere, on the surface of the sphere. So we have our center, and we have one point on the sphere. The only thing we're missing is the radius. We need to know the radius to be able to complete the standard equation of a sphere. But we can find it. The distance between the center and the edge of the sphere is going to be our radius. So we need to find the distance between those two points. We just used the distance formula for 3D to find that. So let's go ahead and use it again. Uh, it doesn't matter which order we put the points. I'm going to do center point minus edge point so that I can add the negatives instead of subtracting. Go ahead and take a second to simplify that so we can find out what the distance is. Whether you do it by hand or use a calculator, you should get the square root of 173. And if we wanted to have a better intuition about what that length is, we could approximate that to be about 13.2. But let's use the exact value because exact numbers are better than approximations. So our distance, the radius, is square root of 173. That's what we will plug in for r in the standard equation of the sphere. So we will have square root of 173 for r, and don't forget r is being square. And then we just need to plug in the a, b, c values. That comes from the center point that was already given to us. So we'll have x minus 10 squared plus y minus 7 squared and then plus z minus 4 squared. And we're done. We've seen a couple of equations in three dimensions, but they can get a little more involved. So let's take a look at some different equations, not just planes. On this slide, we see an equation that's got a product of two binomials and the product is equal to zero. If we want to describe the set of points that satisfies that equation, what we need to do is think about the zero product property. If I have two numbers and I multiply them together and the result is zero, then one of those two numbers had to be zero. Maybe one of them was five, well, then the other one had to be zero. Or maybe one of them was three, well, then the other one had to be zero. Or maybe they were both zero. And that's very possible. So what we're going to do is break our equation apart and say, I know I'm multiplying x minus 4, and I'm multiplying z minus 2. The result is 0, which means either that first factor was the 0, or the second factor was the 0, or maybe they both were. In the first case, if that first factor was 0, then x would have to be equal to 4. If the second factor was 0, then z would have to be equal to 2. So if we wanted to describe the set of points that satisfy this equation, I can use set notation. We've got this cute little curly bracket. Our points are going to be of the form x, y, z, since we're talking about three dimensions. I'm going to use a vertical bar to say, after this, I'll tell you the rules to follow. And then here will be the rules. x must be equal to 4. 
or I need to write or z must be equal to 2. There are no restrictions on y. So let's think about what kind of points would satisfy this. 4, 0, 0. That works because I'm following the rule that x is equal to 4. I could also use 4, 2, 0. That works because I'm following both rules. Maybe I just use the rule that says z has to be equal to 2. That works because I'm following this rule. However, if I wanted to use no rules, this point does not satisfy that equation. If I plug in x equals 0 and z equals 0, I would not get a product of 0 at the end of the day. So the points that satisfy this equation follow these rules. And if I wanted to see what the graph of that looks like, I could graph it in GeoGebra. The solutions to that first portion look like this plane, x equals 4. The solution to that second factor looks like this plane, z equals 2. But the entire solution would be both planes that intersect together. Let's take a look at the second equation on the screen. At first glance, you might think circle. It looks a lot like the equation of a circle, except for z also exists in three dimensions. z is not a part of this equation whatsoever, which means there is no restriction on z. So hopefully we remember the equation of a circle. If we were just in the xy plane, this circle would have a center at x equals 2, y equals 1 and it would have a radius of 2. But we're not simply in the xy plane. We also have a third dimension, the z direction. So this circle is allowed to continue all the way up and all the way down for any value of z. Let's go ahead and describe that using our set notation. Our points look like x, y, z such that well, we're just going to write the equation that's in there. x minus 2 squared plus y minus 1 squared equals 4. That seems like we didn't do a whole lot of work, but what we're doing is showing that we want all the points that satisfy the circle with no restriction on z. And if we wanted to see what that graph would look like, we could type that exact equation into GeoGebra and we would see this red cylinder. Notice that it has the circle that we thought we would see in the xy plane, but it continues all the way up to infinity in the z direction and all the way down to negative infinity in the z direction as well.